Have you ever wondered how the world will go down in flames? Will it be due to zombies, extraterrestrial civilizations, or AI taking over? Nah, turns out it might actually be mosquitoes and scientists causing the chaos. It's funny how things created by nature aren't as threatening as the stuff that doesn't exist naturally. And you know what's on that list? Editing the DNA genome. Experiments with the genetic structure of living organisms can produce completely new species, and no one knows how nature will react to them. Let's look at an example of gene drive. So it all started with malaria mosquitoes. To somehow stop the growth of their population and prevent the spread of malaria, scientists created a gene that magically made mosquitoes only have male offspring. Several insects with this gene transmitted it to others during the mating season and thus spread infertility. Scientists were able to stop malaria and destroy almost the entire mosquito population. But imagine if something went wrong in the mosquito genome and their population began to increase exponentially. Malaria could spread across all continents and create huge problems for all of us. Now let's move from the little mosquito problem to a planetary disaster that can be caused by the desire for knowledge, which is deeply embedded in our nature. British cosmologist Martin Rees once said that we lived in the first century when human beings could determine the planet's future. It seems that it's so easy not to destroy yourself, but our nature is quite complicated. In pursuit of solving the mysteries of the universe, we have built a giant machine that, according to some people, may destroy our planet. And this device is the Large Hadron Collider. The main task of this giant machine is to accelerate particles and make them collide with one another. Scientists expect that the collider will help better understand the structure of our universe. In simple words, this is a miniature simulator of the universe. Using it may also shed light on the mystery of dark matter. During operation, the machine compresses atoms and makes them crash into one another at great speed. Perhaps this is how our universe appeared. Some people fear that a small black hole may form because of this collision. A tiny particle with a huge weight will pull all objects inside itself. Its mass will grow, but its size won't change much. As a result, it will compress the entire Earth and turn it into a ball measuring a little more than 300 feet across. At the same time, our planet will still have the same weight. A powerful gravitational pull on such a small area of matter can form a black hole that might later swallow up our entire solar system. There are also theories that the Hadron Collider could open a portal to a parallel universe with creepy monsters that would enter our world. But of course, such theories have little to do with science. Scientists have already launched the collider several times, and as you can see, nothing terrible has happened. But there is a small nuance. With each launch, scientists increase the speed of particles. Who knows what will happen when they accelerate them too much? According to Martin Rees, the probability that Earth will become a black hole is very, very small. Particles with a much larger energy charge fly in space faster than in the Hadron Collider, and nothing catastrophic happens. Okay, now let's go back to our genomic games to see what else can happen if we continue experimenting with nature. The main problem might be an imbalance in ecosystems. In the 19th century, sailors accidentally brought mice to Gough Island in the South Atlantic Ocean. Rodents had no dangerous enemies there, so their population began to grow mice began to displace dozens of birds from their home. The rodents attacked the chicks and reduced the population of entire species. Trying to save the birds, scientists decided to get rid of the mice, but these little creatures still managed to survive. As a result, the balance of the whole ecosystem was disrupted. Using gene drive to get rid of one species can lead to uncontrolled population growth of another. Imagine that malaria mosquitoes controlled the population of some flies. And what would happen if these flies lost their main natural enemy? The population of these flies would start destroying other species, and it would begin a chain of destructive events. All this suggests that playing with things that don't exist in nature is very dangerous. We worry a lot about how artificial intelligence can take over the world and eliminate us. Still, at the same time, we don't pay attention to our actions. 
Genome editing can lead to positive consequences, such as the appearance of healthier people and destructive ones, like the creation of artificial bacteria that can cause serious health problems. In general, destroying other species is a trait inherent in humans. Because of our actions, many animals have disappeared from the face of the Earth. Moreover, we even destroy each other. Such aggressive behavior is our nature. And artificial intelligence doesn't have anthropomorphic properties. Its logic may be completely different from ours, and instead of destroying people, it might strive to save them. And we have something to save us from. Remember the giant asteroid that erased more than half of the living creatures on Earth? The fall of the space rock caused a massive blast wave, a tsunami, earthquakes, and dust clouds that covered the sun. Dinosaurs and other animals couldn't survive in such conditions. But what if something similar happens these days? Fortunately, we're better prepared than dinosaurs. Firstly, we have the technology to track giant meteorites and calculate their trajectory. And artificial intelligence can also help us with this. Secondly, we can destroy an asteroid before it reaches us. Several powerful rockets will quickly deal with any space rock and turn it into cosmic dust. Moreover, we will know in advance about its approach. But suppose that a huge stone the size of dozens of Everests will fly towards us. In that case, humanity should hurry with Mars colonization. But don't worry. Observing the sky shows that large asteroids capable of causing severe damage to our planet are moving in a different direction. The most giant known asteroid that could collide with Earth might do so in 2088. The probability that it will fall on our planet is 1 in 50,000, so you shouldn't have to worry about threats from outer space. What lies in the bowels of our planet is much more dangerous. Millions of tons of magma and hot gases can burst to the surface through destructive volcanic eruptions. More than 70,000 years ago, a large-scale eruption threw a tremendous amount of ash into the air, which then floated in the atmosphere in the form of a giant gray cloud for a long time. As a result, Earth's surface cooled down by several degrees, which led to one of the most massive extinctions in the history of our planet. Some eruptions happen not only inside volcanoes. There's such a thing as flood basalt. A colossal magma bubble accumulates under a vast area and begins to seep through faults in different parts. Magma slowly goes out there for many years and destroys all living things around. And the worst thing about this situation is that we can't do anything about it. Humanity has learned to track meteorites in space, but we're still not good at predicting a volcano's behavior. Even if we find out that some giant rock will wake up in the next six months, there's nothing we can do about that. We won't be able to prevent an eruption. All we can do is evacuate people from dangerous territory. We have no protection against earthquakes, and even more so, we can't stop the emission of ash into the atmosphere. It's possible that artificial intelligence will help us with this in the future, but right now, we are powerless. As you can see, there are several options for the end of the world for humanity, and they're all slightly different from those imposed by pop culture and the media. In the end, is it right to look for threats from space or artificial intelligence? Look at this spatula. Just a regular tool. Mix and spread ingredients, right? But wait, this one is floating in space for some reason. So there's this astronaut named Pierce Sellers. There he is. He's up there in space, just doing his thing. When all of a sudden, he accidentally drops his trusty spatula. Let me give you some context. This all happened during the Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-121 flight back in 2006. They were on their way to the ISS on a mission to test out some new safety techniques. And now this spatula is just a tiny drop in the ocean of space debris. Humans have been exploring space for, like, over half a century now. We've left all kinds of random stuff up there, from itty-bitty bolts to entire space stations. We've chucked a ton of things into the great beyond. Most of it burns up in a spectacular blaze as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere. But some bigger pieces can be a real danger for astronauts and their fancy spacecraft. Like, imagine accidentally crashing into a massive hunk of space junk. There are other weird things found in space. In November 2008, 
Astronaut Heidi Stefanischon Piper was out on a spacewalk trying to fix a jammed gear on a solar panel. Suddenly, she lost her grip on the bag. That bag weighed around 30 pounds and was filled with all sorts of cool stuff, like grease devices, a scraper tool, and bags for debris. And it was pretty pricey for a tool bag. It cost around $100,000. Sometime later, amateur astronomers spotted the bag floating around in space. If you're in North America, you can even check if the tool bag is passing through your little slice of the sky. Just hop on over to spaceweather.com's satellite tracker and see if you can catch a glimpse of this interstellar tool bag. By the way, if you need to twist some wires in space and you don't have pliers, well, you may stumble upon them as they're free floating in space too. Back in the day, when astronauts were just getting their space groove on, they tended to misplace things up there. During his first spacewalk on the Gemini 4 flight in 1965, Ed White, a famous spacewalker, accidentally let go of his glove. That glove decided to have its own adventure and hung out in orbit for a whole month before getting roasted in Earth's atmosphere. So not all debris is there to stay after all. So, space junk is basically all the stuff floating around in space that humans have left behind. Before we got all curious and started exploring, there wasn't any space debris hanging around. Imagine space junk as a little kid who just learned how to walk and play with their own toys. When they couldn't walk yet, it was easy for the person watching them to keep the play area clean. They were in charge of taking out the toys and putting them away. But now that the kids can walk, they can grab as many toys as they want and make a huge mess on the carpet. Well, it's kind of the same with us humans exploring outer space. We've sent all sorts of cool gadgets, like cameras, rovers, and rockets to check out what's out there. But we haven't really thought about bringing them back to Earth. And that's where the problem comes in. All this space junk floating around could mess up outer space and even our planet. When we think about outer space, we often imagine vast, open spaces that are yet to be fully explored. Humans have only discovered a tiny 5% of the universe. But here's something they might not always consider. The impact of all the cool gadgets they send out there. Believe it or not, as of May 2022, we've got more than 5,000 satellites orbiting Earth. Over 5,000 opportunities for these machines to go haywire, get lost in space, or even worse, create a bunch of debris that could harm both outer space and our lovely planet. There's at least 3,000 satellites just hanging around up there, not doing anything useful, and nobody seems to be bothered about bringing them back home. And what if one of these inactive satellites accidentally collides with one of the thousands of other space junk pieces orbiting our planet? It will result in a catastrophic disaster. We're talking about a crazy release of toxic substances that could wreak havoc on our poor Earth. Space junk can mess things up for scientists trying to make important discoveries. It's not just floating around aimlessly in space or posing a threat to Earth it can hinder their chances of success. Even the moon has its fair share of junk, which Neil Armstrong definitely didn't encounter when he landed there in 1969. Think of it like this. Imagine you're an artist trying to create a huge painting. It's hard to do that if there's a bunch of old paints, brushes, and other stuff cluttering up your play area, right? Well, it's the same deal for scientists trying to set up camp and use new technologies for advanced missions and space exploration. They need a clean and organized space, just like you need a tidy work area. Otherwise, it's chaos. So here's the deal with space junk. It's not just about sending stuff up into the atmosphere. It's also about how far away we send it. You see, when satellites are sent over 22,000 miles into the atmosphere, it becomes a real problem to retrieve them and bring them back to Earth. And that leads to even more space junk floating around up there. Now, I know what you're thinking. How long will it take for space junk to become a major problem? Well, it might still be a few more years before it messes things up in outer space. But hey. That doesn't mean it's not a threat to satellites we have up there right now. 
Those poor guys are at risk of getting damaged, destroyed, or even leaking toxic stuff because of all that junk. So, space debris isn't just a problem for space exploration, but it's also a problem for us Earthlings, even though it's floating thousands of miles above us. Space junk is like that annoying neighbor who throws trash out their window and it ends up in your backyard. Except, instead of trash, it's releasing all sorts of chemicals into our atmosphere that are slowly destroying our precious ozone layer. It can even ruin future space missions. Imagine this, you're all pumped up to launch a rocket into space, but nope, space junk decides to crash the party. Not only does it mess up the launch, but it also adds more pollution to our already struggling atmosphere. And if things couldn't get worse, imagine a shooting star or meteor accidentally smacking into some space junk on its way to Earth. Boom! Millions of toxic particles raining down on us, further depleting the ozone layer. Plus, space debris is becoming a real problem for space missions. In 2022, we found some space debris hanging out on Mars. The Perseverance rover stumbled upon its own backshell, just chilling on the surface of Jezero Crater. They also spotted a random piece of a thermal blanket that might have come from the rover's descent stage. Also, human-made space debris actually smacked into the moon in 2022. It was probably some old rocket body from the 2014 Chang'e 5T1 mission, but nobody saw that coming. It left a double crater behind. The more space junk we have floating around in low Earth orbit, the higher the chances of a cosmic collision. These collisions are no joke. They've already caused some serious satellite damage. Even the ISS has to constantly maneuver to dodge space debris. But scientists seem to know how to clean up this orbital mess. They're planning to send space vehicles armed with nets, harpoons, and even robotic arms to capture and deorbit all that junk. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the Giant Crystal Cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. 
For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white-tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water, and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now. Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. 
And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. The thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost 4 miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet.